Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Holly Fry. And I'm Tracy V. Wilson. This is one of those shows where we have housekeeping before we get to the actual talky talk part. Just a little bit, not too much. Yeah. Um, so first, I want to mention that we have a live show coming up at uh, Midwestern Roots. We're actually part of the pre-programming that kicks it off. That is happening on July 17th in Indianapolis, Indiana. You can get more info and a link to tickets by going to the live shows tab on our website, which is mistinhistory.com. It's right there at the top in the menu. It's easy to find. And soon there will hopefully be uh, some more live shows listed there. We're getting some logistics worked out. Yeah, we have some things that are definitely in the works that are planned for also in the summer and then in the more tentative stages in the fall. Yeah. Um, Second, this episode is sponsored by the upcoming film Godzilla, King of the Monsters. Uh, So the folks behind that film came to us and asked if we would be interested in doing an episode related to the franchise. We said, yep, I love Godzilla, so that was an easy one. Um, And then we worked with them and kicked around some ideas for show topics, and that kind of landed at Godzilla's history. Um, And I first met Godzilla on Saturday afternoon TV... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> which I think a lot of people my age did when I saw the 1956 movie Godzilla, King of the Monsters, very different film, uh, starring Raymond Burr, but really, let's face it, the star is Godzilla. And I loved that movie, but I really did not realize until I was older that that was a re-edit of the film that had originally been released in Japan. I think that's a pretty common experience for most people, like I said, around my age, mm-hmm. uh, that we saw that version and we didn't know until much later that it was really a different film that had been repackaged for the U.S. And so as I started to research this episode and I revisited both that Raymond Burr version and the original, I really realized that the beginning of Godzilla's history is pretty rich on its own. So that becomes the primary focus of this episode. Um, And that is also in part because the Godzilla franchise is massive. Uh, We could do a dozen episodes on just that and never run out of material. Yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. Um, and uh, also we, in full disclosure, have gotten to see the movie already. So I would encourage everyone, if you are into history and into Godzilla, it's worth going back to those early films because you realize how much this new film is very much a love letter to them. And it's very rooted in the origins of of Godzilla's story. Um And uh, it's very fun. We had a lovely talk as well with the director, Michael Doherty, and he is very into the history of Godzilla and into Godzilla's place in a sort of uh, alternate world history and and how that plays out, which adds a nice layer for our history-loving friends out there in the audience. Um, So today... To let you know what you're in for, we're going to talk first about the events that led up to that first film, and then what it took to turn it from an idea into a reality, and then how that film made its way across the Pacific to U.S. audiences and ultimately became the massive juggernaut franchise that it is today. It's a phenomenon. Indeed. Godzilla is, of course, the most famous of all the kaiju And the word kaiju is usually generally translated from Japanese into English along the lines of strange beast. And we've talked before about giant monster movies that aren't Japanese in their origin. Most recently, when we did our stop-motion animation episode, we talked about how Willis O'Brien brought the giant gorilla to life on screen when he was effects supervisor on the 1933 King Kong And we also mentioned how Ray Harryhausen used stop motion to create the monster in the 1953 picture, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. And the 1933 King Kong that we just referenced had also been re-released in Japan in 1952 to great popularity. And it really stirred up fresh interest in moviegoers for big monsters on the big screen. And then the following year, that other movie we just referenced from the U.S., also featuring a big monster, really captured the attention of Japanese audiences. In The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, which was distributed by Warner Brothers in 1953, a dinosaur is awakened from its slumber under the Arctic ice, and it's awakened by nuclear testing. And this dinosaur, known as the Retosaurus, moves south along the east coast of the North American continent and eventually wreaks havoc on Manhattan. This film culminates in a battle between the dinosaur and the U.S. military at Coney Island, where he's finally defeated. 
Yeah, there's some great footage of, you know, this dinosaur in the midst of roller coasters and stuff, which is a pretty fabulous visual. And Harryhausen's Beast and the story of mayhem that unfolded around its awakening from the ice got the attention of Japanese producer Tomoyuki Tanaka, who had been working for the Toho Studios Company since 1940. He did have a brief break in his tenure with the company in the 40s. And when Tanaka saw the Beast from 20,000 Fathoms, the occupation of post-World War II Japan by U.S. military, which lasted from 1945 to 1952, had only just ended. So there was this new level of opportunity to tell stories that would really not have been possible or not cool to tell uh, just the year before during that occupation. In addition to Kong's renewed popularity in Japan and the story of Warner Brothers' Ritasaurus, another event took place that impacted the mindset of the Japanese public and Godzilla's creators. On March 1st, 1954, a nuclear weapons test was performed at the Bikini Atoll in the South Pacific. So nuclear testing at the Bikini Atoll was not a new thing. That spot had been used by the United States as a test site since 1946. And the history of that testing and how the island population was treated uh, could and hopefully will be its own episode. Eventually, it's not a super fun story, but it's important. Uh, But on that morning in 1954, a Japanese fishing boat... Uh, its name translates to Lucky Dragon Number 5, was close enough to the test that the boat and its entire crew of 23 men were contaminated by nuclear fallout. Uh, There are additional details around that, which also would be great in another episode about why they were close and some um, inaccurate estimates of how powerful that test was going to be. Um, But when the men were examined, it was determined that they all had acute radiation syndrome. And their catch, they were fishermen after all, which had already been sent to market by the time the severity of the situation was realized, was recalled, though it is believed that some of those fish were sold and presumably were eaten. Yeah, I think we talked some about this incident in our... um our episodes about the the thousand cranes for our thousandth episode. Yes. The Lucky Dragon incident was a reminder that almost a decade after the war, nuclear weaponry was still a very real threat even in times of peace. That reminder really resonated with producer Tomoyuki Tanaka, and he pitched a film to his boss at Toho inspired by the incident and borrowing from Harryhausen's dinosaur feature. This proposed film would be called The Beast from 20,000 Miles Under the Sea, The giant monster genre was still seen as really the domain of United States cinema, but Tanaka was given the green light to move ahead with this idea. Yeah, that was apparently a very tentative green light. Like, I don't know, but okay. Um, And as an aside, we should mention before we get into Toho's giant and now famous lizard, that uh, there was also a Japanese silent film that had been made that was inspired by King Kong. And that came out in 1938 titled King Kong Appears in Edo. So Gojira that we're about to talk about was not the first time Japanese filmmakers were inspired by American monster cinema to create their own version. Uh, But in the case of the Japanese Kong, that film is lost, and there's still some questions about it. Film historians will sometimes point to this two-part film as the beginning of Japan's giant monster film genre, but there is ongoing debate about exactly how giant this monster was uh, and the size of the gorilla involved. There are some people who believe he was actually a giant monster in terms of scale in the film, uh, but others suggest that it was actually kind of just a, a regular gorilla that was largish in size. It would not really qualify as a kaiju of any kind. It's a little early for a sponsor break, but we are going to stick one here so that we can keep the next chunk of the story together. It all goes into lots of detail about how Toho's big monster film was made. We want to keep all that stuff in the same segment. Once Tanaka had his monster movie project approved, he put together the team that would develop it and get it to the big screen. And Tanaka had already produced a film with director Ishiro Honda in 1952 called The Man Who Came to Port, and he turned to Honda again for his monster film. Honda had directed dramas and war films for Toho already, including 1953's Eagle of the Pacific, which was a box office success. And that featured the first collaboration between Honda and special effects director Eiji Tsubaraya, who was also brought on to Tanaka's monster film. By the time Honda joined the project, the story had already been written by a writer named Shigeru Kayama. 
Kayama's script was handed over to Honda and to screenwriter Takeo Murata to be finessed into an actual shooting script. Honda not only co-wrote the film, he was also heavily involved in almost every aspect of it, and he was also a trusting collaborator at the same time. When it came to Tsuburaya's effects, the special effects director was allowed to do his work without having to have Honda's supervision. Yeah, that would have been kind of unusual uh, for an effects director to just kind of have his own free reign, but... That was in part because Subaraya, who was a decade older than Honda, could be very willful. He kind of had a reputation for being a little bit hard to work with. He didn't like when his shots were edited when he had worked with other directors, and he had very, very strong and clear ideas about how he wanted things done. But between him and Ashiro Honda, a very balanced professional relationship really blossomed. They trusted one another, and as a consequence, each man really did his best work. They would visit each other's sets, but that was more to see how logistics were playing out so that when they each shot their own segments, they would blend together as seamlessly as possible. It wasn't so much like, I'm coming to supervise you, as I'm coming to make sure our collaboration works. It's worth noting that making this film was considered very risky for a director like Ishiro Honda, He was on track to build a serious career as a director. So to take on a film in a new genre, one that had the potential to turn out very silly when it was meant to be serious, was really putting his reputation on the line. I think this still happens today sometimes when somebody has a reputation as a very serious director, then they take on a project that might look kind of goofy. He committed to it entirely, though, and he expected everyone working on the film to have the same level of dedication. In an interview with his wife, Kimi, she described the first day of the shoot, quote, he told them on the very first day, read the script. If you are not convinced, please let me know immediately and leave the project. I remember him saying this very firmly. He only wanted those who had the absolute confidence to work with him on this film. Both producer Tanaka and effects director Subaraya were of the same mind. All three men had agreed that this film would only work if they took it on as a serious project. And initially, Tsuburaya had some ideas that did not, in fact, make it through production. He originally thought that the film's creature star should actually be a massive octopus, but producer Tanaka put his foot down on the idea that it had to be more like a dinosaur. And the effects director also initially pitched stop motion to bring that monster to life. But with only six months to make the film from pre-production to completion, that was not going to work. We talked in our stop motion episode that, like, Even today, with the most advanced technology and people who really, really know what they're doing, you only get a few seconds a day. So uh, for people that were learning it, (laughs) it was never going to happen in any kind of realistic timeline. And that's how what came to be known as Suitmation was born. Tsuburaya hired Tiezo Toshimitsu and his team to create a full-body rubber suit based on designs by Akira Watanabe, who was the film's production designer. Cloth wire, and latex were all part of this beast that borrowed design elements from an iguanodon, a stegosaurus, a tyrannosaurus, and an alligator into a form that a human man could wiggle into to bring Gojira to life. And that human man was stunt actor Haruo Nakajima, who would go on to play Godzilla for almost two decades. And that was no small feat. This suit weighed an estimated 91 kilograms, that's 200 pounds, and he could only walk limited distances in it at any given time because it was so taxing on his body. He passed out on several occasions while working in the suit. He nearly drowned while filming one of the water scenes. Uh, This was not an easy task. And since the creature would make use of a human in a suit, that also meant that many recreations of locations around Japan had to be created for the sets, since the monster was supposed to tower over them. While working on this film, Tsuburaya was completely protective of the monster's image. Even cast members weren't allowed to see the Gojira costume. The concern was that if they saw the costume on its own without all the movie magic involved, they might think it was silly and then that would sour the whole production. And Nakajima was basically creating a whole new style of performance. No one knew what to tell him in terms of direction because using a suit like the one in film had really never been done before. He studied animal movements and prepared for the strength and endurance that being in this suit required. But ultimately, the suit and its limitations governed the performance and how he moved. 
Yeah, he didn't have full range of motion. So it's like you can prepare all you want, but when you get in the suit, maybe your arm only moves a little. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when we spoke with the director of the new film, he mentioned that he had gotten to try on the top half of one of the newer suits that had been made by Toho. And even that, in the more modern era, was excruciating. So imagining this 200-pound suit and wearing it around seems like um, an act of athleticism that's hard to comprehend for us mere mortals. One element of production that has remained something of a history mystery is exactly where the name Gojira came from. And there is one tale which has absolutely no substantiation that the name originated as a nickname for one of the Toho Studios employees who was portly and that it was a portmanteau of the Japanese words for gorilla and whale. But again, there is no evidence that anyone has found to back that up. Even people who worked on the production are like, I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, so it remains an element of film lore. People like to tell the story, but there's, there's no, uh, no evidence for it. It is also possible that story writer Shigeru Kayama came up with the name pretty early on. There have been some hints that he actually mentions that name in his diary, but that is also not entirely clear. The bottom line is we don't know the origination of the name, really. A groundbreaking aspect of Honda's film is the use of actors in scenes where they couldn't see what they were acting against. Today, it's commonplace for actors to have this challenge of working within digital effects and needing to emote and react as a character to things they just can't see. But for the Japanese actors on Honda's set, this was a totally new concept. Actor Akira Takarada later described the experience from the performer's point of view as being like children, needing to constantly ask what they were doing. Honda was always patient and kind and explained everything to them, especially the younger, more inexperienced actors. He knew that the performances had to be as serious and real as possible to carry this film. As with any film in the sound era, the music and sound design play a vital role in bringing Gojira to life. For one, studio heads were concerned that the film and its monster still looked too silly, despite all of the camera and effects work, until they saw it with Akira Ifukubi's score. It's a score that he wrote actually without benefit of seeing the film initially, although he did at the very end get to kind of tighten it up and, and make some adjustments to make it match. And Ifukube is also credited with creating some of the most important things that you hear in the film and that you can probably conjure in your mind, uh, the monster's unique screech and its footfalls. The vocalizations of Honda's star creature, which are now iconic, were created by dragging a leather glove across the strings of a purposely detuned contrabass. And the footsteps, which are almost a character on their own, were the result of the composer thumping an amplifier. While the production had a timeline of six months, only two of them were spent actually shooting. In a schedule that would seem unthinkable by today's film standards, the script was finished on June 10th, 1954, the design and other pre-production started immediately after that. Photography started in August of 1954. That was finished in October, and then the film was released in theaters on November 3rd. That blows my mind. <laughs> Every time I think through it, I'm like, holy Moses. Uh, the location shoots that they had to do were incredibly challenging. They were filming in the summer heat, and that meant that actors were often running from the monster in already grueling temperatures, Adding all that physical exertion caused a lot of heat exhaustion on set. It almost became an issue where, like, they had to manage potential heat exhaustion as much as any other aspect of production. Coming up, we will talk about the film's life once it was released into cinemas. But first, we will pause and take a quick sponsor break. <laughs> Once the film was released, it was a huge hit with audiences. There were critics, however, who felt that using the very real tragedies in Japan's recent history to drive a monster movie was in poor taste, even if the message of that movie was ultimately uh, one of being careful about how we tamper with nature. But despite those concerns raised in some reviews, the movie was an undeniable blockbuster. It was Japan's highest grossing film of 1954. Toho had been really smart about marketing for the film, knowing that warming the audience up to what could be taken as an absurd premise was going to be vital to its acceptance. Throughout the shoot, press had been invited to visit the sets where Honda was shooting, though all the creature work that Tsuburaya was shooting at the same time was not open to the journalists. 
Promotional photos were released to the press so that the public could see what Toho was cooking up in this new film. There was a lead-up radio play that unfolded in 11 episodes. It actually started running before principal photography began. And all of this made the idea of a serious film starring a 50-foot-tall creature, an event that was being greeted with a lot of anticipation. In some ways, the audience was won over way before any projected image hit a screen in a public movie theater. Obviously, this is similar to how movie marketing works today. (laughs) Yeah, that's how everyone does it now. (laughs) Yeah, people have their minds made up a lot of times before they get into the theater because they've seen all of these stills and heard stories leading up to it. Yeah, it's fascinating. When you think about, like, how Entertainment Weekly, like, they will have a big splash cover article about, like, an upcoming film and talking all about it. And I'm like, this is all kind of rooted back in the things they were doing for Godzilla. So when we think of old-school giant monster movies today, probably a lot of people think of them as sort of campy or silly, and that reputation does have a very real basis in film history. There have been a lot of films made, both in the U.S. and Japan and in other countries over time, that featured monsters that look funny or they behave really comedically. But the 1954 Gojira is a much more sober film. It is quite obviously rooted in the nuclear tragedies that Japan experienced in the years leading up to its production. In one scene early on, testimony is being given about the unthinkable possibility that a giant creature has suddenly emerged from the sea and poses a danger to human life. The character Dr. Yamane says, quote, it was probably hidden away in a deep sea cave, providing for its own survival, and perhaps for others like it. However, repeated underwater H-bomb tests have completely destroyed its natural habitat. To put it simply, hydrogen bomb testing has driven it from its sanctuary. And later in that same scene, there is a very heated debate about whether to go public with the information that Gojira is a threat. And one of the issues that's cited for withholding that information is the chaos that could be done politically, including damaging very delicate foreign relations. There is a very clear parallel being drawn to Japan's actual relationship with its foreign colleagues outside the world of the film that was going on post-World War II. And in a scene immediately following, as the news is breaking, there's a, a young woman who's riding a streetcar, and she remarks to another passenger, I barely escaped the atomic bomb in Nagasaki, and now this. Uh, Incidentally, all these quotes that we are reading are from the subtitles of the Criterion Collection edition of the film. Yeah, just in case anyone's wondering, since it is in Japanese. (laughs) Uh, Gojira is grim throughout. It does not pull any punches regarding the danger of nuclear testing. So after the creature attacks a city and his atomic breath covers entire city blocks, children are shown being tested for radiation and coming up positive. Children see their parents die. Even the scientist who invents the means by which humans can defeat their giant ancient foe is conflicted about introducing such a serious weapon into the world. And the message of nuclear testing being a dangerous thing is reiterated right to the end, even after they have defeated the creature. Gojira was shipped to the United States in very limited distribution, and that's how producer Edmund Goldman saw it. He bought the distribution rights from Toho after this and then flipped them to Jewel Enterprises. The executives at Jewel, like Goldman, saw the potential of this film, but they felt that it needed some doctoring to truly capture American audiences. And it was at this stage that Gojira kind of morphed at the suggestion of the Toho marketing department into Godzilla to make it easier for English speakers to approximate the name. And the film underwent a number of revisions to repackage it for U.S. screens for a much wider distribution. About 15 minutes of the film were cut to minimize concepts that would be difficult for U.S. culture to grasp, like an arranged marriage that's part of the the original film. There's also uh, scenes that would have been uncomfortable, like the villainy of nuclear weapons, which the U.S. had recently used against Japan. And of course, the whole premise is based on nuclear testing as the catalyst for the movie's central conflict. So it could not be removed completely, but a lot of the very grim scenes which give Honda's original version so much gravity were removed. There were also scenes that were added to the film in the U.S. version, which starred Raymond Burr as a journalist named Steve Martin. Burr's segments were used to give a different perspective to the film and to tell the story as seen through the eyes of Burr's character— In the film, Burr was sent to report on the incidents in Japan. 
This newly cut film was titled Godzilla, King of the Monsters and released in U.S. cinemas on April 27, 1956. And just as was the case in Japan, critics did not fall in love with the film. But that did not matter because audiences sure did. Uh, Godzilla was, again, an instant hit. And that recut version of the film ended up being distributed internationally, gaining new audiences wherever it opened. By the time Godzilla King of the Monsters had made its U.S. debut, Japanese audiences were already watching the sequel to the original, which was called Godzilla Raids Again. That was directed by Motoyoshi Oda, with Eiji Tsuburaya once again serving as the effects director. And that was just the beginning. In the almost 65 years since Gojira first appeared in Japanese cinemas, almost three dozen films have been made featuring Godzilla. And in 2014, the Guinness Book of World Records named it the longest continually running film franchise. Uh, This film that's about to come out is the 35th. They're already slated to work on follow-ups to it, so it will hit... Uh, Three Dozen very quickly. And the films have taken on some wildly different tones over the years, as Toho, which has continued to make all but three of the movies in the franchise's history, has shifted in its tone for the series and made a number of reboots. Over time and through different eras of production, additional kaiju have been added to the Godzilla lineup, and a lot of them started out in their own films, including Mothra and Rodan. There have been TV series, video games, toys, all kinds of merchandise featuring Godzilla as well. In 2004, which was the 50th anniversary of the Japanese version Gojira, uh, it was restored digitally by Rialto Pictures and released in theaters and on home video. And this was, for a lot of fans, the first time that they had ready access to the movie that started it all. There, That was also sort of revelatory in um, film circles because I think... People had not realized how much had been cut from the original to make it more comfortable and palatable for American audiences. Mm -hmm. Um, So it kind of, that moment is really quite pivotal in film history where people realize like, oh, you really did do some serious changing to this original film. Yeah. Well, and I like certainly knew that the preponderance of big monster movies in the 50s was uh, in a lot of ways a response to... Uh, the the nuclear attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the threat of nuclear warfare and this idea of radiation causing giant creatures to exist and do terrible things. But I didn't really know until reading your outline how much the original Japanese Gojira was really like an anti-war movie and it wasn't just about radiation made this thing at kind of an abstract level. Yeah. We talked about, you know, how it, kind of was inspired also by the American movie, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. One thing that's really interesting is that even though that beast was awakened by nuclear testing, like Gogeta was in the first one, uh, it stayed, it just was awakened. It wasn't morphed. It did not take on any atomic powers the way Godzilla does. And it, it really kind of shifts the gear to be a little bit more of a film about not messing with nature. <laughs> right, right. Um which I'm only laughing because it it's it's always so strongly been that. And I mm-hmm. realizing that it had its roots in some films from the US that didn't really take that part of it into account was kind of interesting. There was also a um an interesting commentary that I read in one of the sources I was using for this one where they made the point that uh the films, the creature films that came out of Japan often have that that much more um ecologically minded ideology where they actually even though they recognize they have to battle the creature to save humanity there is a, a certain level of empathy for the creature and like understanding that we did this mm-hmm. whereas if you look at most of the US made films with creatures none of that is in there it's just like this is a threat we got to kill it and they don't really have that same that same level of sensitivity to like cause and effect in it uh which is pretty interesting i would want to do a bigger survey of of creature films from the era to really see how that plays out, but right. it, it made me think for sure. Um, so, yeah, and again, thanks to uh, to uh, the new Godzilla King of the Monsters and to Michael Doherty for talking to us about it. Uh, he's so passionate about it, and like we said, he really knows a lot of Godzilla history on his own and can speak extemporaneously at length about it. Um, so it's cool that he is getting to, uh, to be a big part of this universe now. And, uh, yeah, hopefully everyone will see and enjoy it. I have to say that's the most beautiful Mothra has ever looked, in my opinion. Yeah. She's spectacularly beautiful. Mm -hmm. The film is absolutely beautiful. Um, 
in terms of just like cinematography and composition, it's really spectacular. And in fact, as I mentioned at the top, harkens back a lot to this original film, um, which is kind of a lovely homage in a way that still feels very new and fresh. I have completely unrelated listener mail. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I came into the office today to find a very strange and delightful gift on my desk. It is tiny but delightful. Um, It is from our listener, Sean, and he writes, Hello, Holly. Enclosed is a path tag for you. Path tags are small coins created by geocachers to leave in caches as a sort of calling card. I had a bunch of these made up a few years ago. Thanks to you and Tracy for all of the podcasts. But what makes this very, very cool is he has this teeny tiny coin that is made with my Haunted Mansion boyfriend, the Hatbox Ghost, on it. (laughs) Oh, yay. And it glows in the dark, and there's a hidden Mickey when it glows in the dark. I have not been able to get it into a dark room because I just opened it this morning, and then we had to run into the studio. But it's adorable, and I love it, and I kind of want to make a necklace charm out of it. So thank you so much, Sean. What a cool thing. And it's really beautifully designed, and I love it. So uh, that is a deep treasure for me. If you would like to write to us, you can do so at historypodcast at howstuffworks.com. You can also find us across the spectrum of social media as Missed in History. And you can visit us in our online home, which is mistinhistory.com, where you can find every episode that's ever existed since the show began and we were not even associated with it. Uh, if you would like to subscribe to the podcast, that sounds great. You can do that on the iHeartRadio app, at Apple Podcasts, or anywhere else that you listen to podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows. 